Okay, so let me first summarize that what we were discussing yesterday. So we, we started the discussion about the GRBs. So, for example, this is a luminosity as a function of time. So this, for the short GRBs, we see some uh, short pulse within two seconds. And this is a typical uh, GRB. The total energy is about into the 51. Area. And this is what we saw in a merger event. And uh, I just write something like below because it was very faint in, a, you know, in terms of luminosity. The isotropic equivalent energy is like uh, four or five orders of magnitude lower than the typical short GRBs. And even two or what? Two times two, two orders of magnitude fainter than the faintest short GRBs, we we know. And it's in, interesting fact. One thing is uh, we, I didn't mention yesterday. There is a de delay between the gravitational wave arrival time and the GRB arrival time. It was about uh, two seconds. And the duration is also about two seconds. And initial initial pulse was at about 0.2 second, and then we have soft tail. And if you look at this spectrum and then try to fit where is the fo most of the photon is coming, then most of the photon of the initial spike, most of the energy, actually energy, of the photon is uh, about uh, uh, 200 keV. So this typical energy is uh, not very different from uh, normal short GRBs, but uh, if we, you plot this uh, peak energy of the photons and total energy, then you see very big difference between the normal short GRB and this uh, event. So before I go, go into the detail of the calculation, let me tell you one another thing. So this is... So we often observe, after the gamma ray burst, we often observe some uh, afterglow, which is also bright, in a very different way, broad wavelength. So this is just uh, what we see in the gamma ray and the X-ray. But after the GRB, we often see some very broad band, uh, long-lived flare. We call it afterglow. So if you look at the luminosity, normal short GRBs, for example, something like this. This is just, uh, usually it's a beautiful power law. So luminosity initially very bright, just after the, mud, sorry, after the burst. Let's say, I don't know, 100 seconds or something like this. After we see this pulse, the telescope tries to quickly see this X-ray or optical afterglow. So X-ray, something like this, and the optical, something like this. And if you look at the... So this is, for example, this is one day. So it's a sort of long-lived, you can see, for one week. And uh, the typically, it's, of course, the, this luminosity of the afterglow varies uh, for different events. So typically, I would say at one day, that the luminosity is about into the 43 Earth per second. So this is very bright. And now, of course, after this short GRB, this uh, GRB detected by Fermi, X-ray satellite tried to detect this afterglow. But actually, what happened was uh, it turns out to be very different. So up to, say, yeah, 10 days. So we, we for G this major event, we didn't see any afterglow, X-ray, radio, we didn't see. Optical, so optical, but this was not like power low, power low afterglow, it was a kilonova. So we, we see a kilonova at the, around one day, but it was not afterglow. And usually X-ray afterglow is quite bright, so we, it, this is really what we see is jet pointing toward us, we expect something like this. But what we see is some up, upper limit until uh, about 10 days, nine days probably. At about 10 days, we have detection here. It 
it was a uh, say first detection was uh, 10 to the about 39 years per second I think so we do, we didn't see this uh, very uh, faint early time and then decline but now here at, at 10 days we in the end saw some afterglow Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, sorry, this is uh, not really meaningful. So, <laughs> some uh, typical shows GRB has this range. And since this de first detection, so this is uh, just upper limit and detection. And afterward, what happened is uh, this go up, so slowly goes up, up to about 150 days, right? And then go down. So here it was a. Uh, I think five or something like this. So you can see the energy in the GRB was very, very different. But this looks like similar, but now if you look at the afterglow, it's more, much more different from normal short GRBs. I would say we never see in such kind of X-ray afterglow after short GRBs. Uh, not only X-rays. So yeah, if you look at the radio, so radio is something like this. Uh, yeah, luminosity is fainter. Radio also something like this. The tape is similar. So radio. And there is a, also one optical data point. So radio, there are many, many data points, including the GMRT and VLA. And optical, there was around here maybe 100 days. There is one Hubble observation. So this nature that the afterglow is seen in a broad spectrum is very similar, but the light curve was quite different. So I would say we, so people who are not really, have not been really converged what's going on, but uh, I can try to tell you what we can learn from this uh, and why it's so different from the short GRBs. Yes. Optical point here. Uh, good question. There are, actually there are no X-ray also here. So what, the main reason we why we don't have data here is the sun. The location of the sun is close to the, the source. The, only the radio was able to see this, this epoch. And also, this is a quite faint source for the optical. So only the, this one, uh, I think, detected by Hubble Space Telescope. So you need something, you know, very good sensitivity. So that, that's why people don't really have many points. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I know only this data point. Someone knows any optical update? Not yet published. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so it will be published, then you will know. <laughs> Uh, okay, Some, any more questions so, so far?
Okay, then I move to some uh, cal calculations. <clears throat> to tell you is uh, <coughs> we need uh, some <coughs> a relativistic outflow. So first, I think uh, it's better to see why we, we it, this kind of uh, phenomena requires relativity. So let's consider Newtonian outflow first. So let, let's assume the outflow is Newtonian O. So what I'm, now I'm imagining something like this situation. So I have uh, some expanding material. Uh, so yeah, let me clarify. So at the merger, I have some mass ejection. And after a while, probably the jet or some outflow with more energy or more high velocity is produced. Say, some, uh, let's imagine some jet. So this jet has a higher velocity than this outflow. So it goes inside the, this ejector. So because this is very fast and colliding with this expanding gas, so they have a, in this situation, we expect bow shock, right? This bow shock around this, uh, uh, around this fast moving jet inside. So this shock, the material called, we call this is cocoon. And this is jet. So this jet is moving outward and this uh, shock wave also moving outward. And also at the same time, the ejector is also expanding. Now, after a while, it, this is faster than the ejector velocity at some point. This breaks out from this uh, Something like this. So this is shock wave. So what I'm imagining. I'm cons what I'm considering here is uh, because this is shock, for example, behind the shock you have a huge internal energy. Right? This is uh, comparable to the kinetic energy of the shock, the, the velocity sweeping this material. So suddenly this shock breaks out from uh, uh, this ejector and then release the photon. So let's imagine we are looking at somewhere, somewhere we don't exactly know. Maybe somewhere here we are here. Or somewhere here. So the, what LIGO tells us is uh, the viewing angle, let's say this is viewing angle theta, is uh, if you accept some value of a Hubble constant, it's about 30 degree. It is likely we are something standing away from the axis about 30 degree. Yes, this is the assumption that uh, so this viewing angle is actually the momentum, sorry, angular momentum vector of the binary and the line of sight angle. But now I'm let, uh, let me assume that the uh, the jet is going to the angular momentum vector. So this is, so this is, for example, the situation that now I'm, I am interested in. 
So the, for the, let's assume Newtonian outflow. So velocity is, uh, let's, so this velocity is less than, let's say, less than C, and then let's neglect uh, all the relativity here. So first of all, the one important thing is uh, this time scale. This spike was delta T is uh, 0.2 seconds. So time variability of my photons was about 0.2 second. And this is a, for, for Newtonian case, this is re limited by the size of the emission region divided by C. So this is a, should be the size. Oh, delta T is a time variability. The, yes, GRB part, yes. So today, I think I don't have time to discuss afterglow, so I will mostly focus on GRB part. So I'm, I'm talking about GRB now. So I define this time varia variation. So minimum is about 0 0.2 second. So for the Newton, then this, let's say this breakout occurs at R, some radius R. And our, my time value, and then suddenly this R, the shock, shock breaks out and they emit photon. Then my time variability is roughly this R divided by C. Yes, so what do, now I'm, I, want in, I want to know is, uh, so we don't know when this happens, but because we know the time variability is this time, so we can estimate what is the size of the breakout radius. Okay. Relativist, yes. So now, yes, yes, it's a s sort of a step by step. First, I want to show when I, what happened when I assume the outflow is Newtonian, and then I move to the relativistic case. So from this observation, I know the size of the source is about uh, delta T times C. Then, because we see some photons at this radius r, the tau, my optical depth, which is a kappa rho delta r, let's say the photon is emitted by very thin layer, this width of delta r. Then my op optical depth of this uh, emission region given by tau, kappa rho, delta r. So this is uh, the mass inside uh, this uh, thin ray layer. The mass in this in this uh, emission layer. So I would call it delta m, let's say. Delta m, yes, del delta, yes, delta m is four pi r square. Is okay. Yes, 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 yes. But density is uh, doesn't matter. It's a uh, whole swell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is the next step. So first I will do in a Newtonian and what's going to see what's going on. Tau? Oh, tau is optical depth of a... So in order to emit the radiation from this layer, and also this is non-thermal radiation, the optical depth, so 
emission, non-thermal emission, for example. I need a tau is unity. So now I want to see what is tau with this situation. So this is a requirement of my outflow. So otherwise, it can't produce non-thermal radiation at this radius. No, no. No, no, my delta t is not uh, this delta t. My delta t is this time, time duration. And my duration is about uh, photo arriving photon from here and from here, or something like this. So imagine you have some spherical shell and emit photons at our radius. What is the duration of this emission? R divided by C. Is this clear? It's just not clear? This is clear? <laughs> not clear. Yes. I'm saying at at radius r, I have shell, and this shell at this radius emit photon. Then what is the duration of this emission? This is time delay, photon crossing time of this size of the shell. Is it OK? OK. Yes. So. And you want to get the significant emission in non-thermal emission, I need the tau to be unity. And uh, what is this? <coughs> and because uh, now my situation, so I have also the photon energy, total photon energy radiated in this shell, should be something like, uh, let's define some efficiency epsilon times my kinetic energy. So in this shock, some kinetic energy of the shell with some efficiency is released, I mean converted to the photon. So from this relation, I can write down this tau. We write tau, say kappa. What is this? Kappa E iso. And uh, maybe divided by epsilon. So this is uh, my optical depth of this photon emitting shell. So now I, can, I know, for example, kappa for the electron scattering. Electron scattering kappa is 0 0.4. And now E iso, as I said, it's a, in the initial spike, it's about three times 10 to the six, three times 10 to the 46. And this is this uh, 0 0.2 sec two second. So the tau, now I can calculate my tau, is about 10 to the f six times 10 to the four. Maybe divided by epsilon.
Now you can see, so I don't expect uh, this epsilon to be very, very large. I mean, the photon energy should not be so large compared to the kinetic energy. For, for the shock dissipation mechanism, I expect this is order unity, so, pro so this is up to less, about order unity or less than order unity. So even if I take V as to, to be C, speed of light, you get a huge optical depth. So in this uh, Newtonian calculation, I cannot get, uh, I cannot explain the GRB, this GRB emission with this total amount of energy and this small time vari variability. So this is why, first of all, we, we need to uh, discard this, this Newtonian outflow. Okay. Uh, yeah, this ejector shell is, even though it's non-relativistic, non but this shock velocity can be relativistic, right? This, uh, so, so the, the fluid motion of the shock of the material can be relativistic. So, right, so yeah, now I will show where, how I can change this. For example, here, delta T calculation is actually not correct if you take into account the relativistic motion. So, let's uh, go to the relativistic calculation. So when I say relativistic beaming effect, it sounds familiar? Familiar? Familiar. Anyone haven't heard about relativistic beaming? Yes, then I, I, sh I think I should uh, explain a little bit. Because relativistic beaming is one of the most uh, important concepts on this GRB and also afterglow, so let me a little bit explain. So I have two frames. Uh, let's say I'm here. And here I have something, some material is sitting here, moving with velocity beta. And say Lorentz factor is uh, one minus beta square. This is a velocity divided by c, and Lorentz factor is defined by this. Now the two quantities between this fr frame is just uh, connected by the Lorentz transformation. So I think this is supposed to be. Familiar, right? So that this delta x or delta t in this frame, if you want to calculate this delta t in this frame to this frame, you have to convert with this Lorentz transformation. Then you can calculate, for example, so if this object is moving something like this, so let's say u prime in this frame, then I can calculate velocity vector in this observer. So, the, so for example, Just ignore z direction, just to x and y direction. If I have a, so in this frame I have u, to ux prime and uy prime. 
and convert to this this frame, then what I get is UX something like this, and UI something like this. So big difference here for non non relativistic. This is unity, for example. But for in relativistic case, the gamma can be very large. And UX doesn't really affected by the Lorentz factor here. But now UI in this guy is very small. So the most important consequence, one of the important consequences of this is, uh, for example, if I, this guy calculated, calculated angle of this vector in, in this frame, so let's say tangent theta, This is a velocity vector component in this frame. It's a So now I can, I, for example, let me consider this scenario that uh, I have something uh, emitting photon in this direction, not in a zero velocity in the x. In this moving frame, I emit photon this way. So u x y prime is now c, and u x prime is uh, zero. So for photo, so let's imagine this situation. Ui prime is c, ux prime equals zero. Then tangent theta is just uh, one over gamma theta. So you can easily show that the uh, sine theta equal is one over gamma. So if gamma is very very large, so you get theta is one over gamma. So this is uh, what is, this says. So even though I emit photon in this frame, this just this direction, the y direction. For this guy, the angle between u y and this vector is now let's see one over gamma. It's very very small. So which means. This frame I emit photon this way, but in the end of this vector goes like this. So if the gamma is very, very large, this object moving very fast, then the photon emitted here goes like angle of uh, one over gamma. So this is a relativistic beaming. So now you can imagine, for example, I emit photons isotropically this frame. The half, half of the photon emitted this way, and half of the photon emitted this way. So half of the photon is concentrated this very, very narrow cone. So, and in terms of the energy, most of the energy is radiated inside this cone. So this is uh, called the relativistic beaming. So you can remember this uh, uh, formula. So now I have a, this shell is expanding not V less than C, but close to C. So let's say this, edge, this shell is moving with a Lorentz factor gamma. So what happened to this guy is uh, Now let's put the, so let's forget about jet. So let's imagine the uniform shell. So this shell is moving with relativistic Lorentz factor gamma. And I'm, I'm here. So what I see is, uh, I see photon coming from here, right? This is 
concentrated at this one over gamma cone, I can see these uh, photons. But now, the photon emitted from here is, uh, again, this is one over gamma. I can barely see these photons. But here, this cone is away from uh, my line of sight. So what I can see is just uh, this uh, small uh, cone with uh, one of a gamma angle. So now, my time variability now changed, right? Now the time duration of this emission is photon emitted time delay between the photon emitted here and the photon emitted here. So this is, a, you can calculate this delta, delta T is about one minus cosine one more, one more gamma R over C. So this is a two gamma square. So because uh, if Lorentz factor is very fast, I can see very, very small region of the emission region. So time var variability becomes very, very small. So now I can modify so this relativistic effect. So in relativity, I need uh, this factor. Now also I need to modify. So this is also a relativistic, non-relativistic case. This should be something like this. So now I can calculate this uh, optical depth with this delta T expression and the uh, EISO expression. But what I can get is uh, additional factor because I have a gamma square here and the R square gives, gives me gamma to the four and one gamma is coming from here and then I have one over gamma five. Say this is Newtonian. So if I increase the gamma, I can reduce the this value. So in order to get the tau of unity, what I need is uh, this is same. Yeah, so. Seven. So if the Lorentz factor is about seven, I get the optical depth of unity. So then my this shell can emit the radiation with the appropriate time scale, time duration, and the given EIS energy. This is a one way to show how much uh, Lorentz factor is required for the uh, my outflow. But uh, for example, I don't know what is epsilon. For example, epsilon or something like this. So this is one way. But uh, sometimes people do is just take a spectrum of the GRB and ask uh, what is the optical depth. This is just I calculated 
what I calculate is uh, optical depth to the electron scattering, which associated with the baryon that I have. But uh, what usually people do is uh, calculate the pair production process. So because from EISO and the spectrum, you can calculate how much high energy photon you have. And then you can calculate what is the optical depth of the photon-photon interaction and get pair production. So this is uh, more you can based on the you can be based on the observation. So in a tutorial, I put the, this exercise to estimate uh, using this pair production uh, argument. So questions. Right, so because if you increase this ten to 10 to the 51, you get another 10 to the 5 here. Then what you need is uh, increase the Lorentz factor more by factor of 10. Typical Lorentz factor. Uh, I would say 100 for the classical uh, GRBs. I mean, short GRBs. But uh, first, uh, first, thing, first thing we want to know is, uh, OK, let's uh, do this exercise, just how much Lorentz factor I can get from just the observational factor, this uh, energy and this time variability. Forget about this is the same as the other short GRBs. Yes, now I'm. I will explain the off-axis case. It's a little bit more complicated. Uh, anything else? That's OK. OK, finally, before I finish this spherical case, now I can calculate this case. What is the time delay between the merger and uh, gamma ray burst. Because uh, we get uh, this uh, radius r. What was that? Uh, radius r. I forget to write down, but uh, <coughs> let's say. Now radius r is uh, 2 gamma square delta t. And this is about, say, 100. Delta t is 0 0.2 second. And this is 3 times 10 to the 10. So what is this? This 6 times 10 to the, how much? 11 centimeter. So this is uh, the, roughly the size of my gamma ray emitting shell. But the, as we saw, uh, let's see. Before the breakout, the ejector shell is moving. Sorry, this is uh, too messy. So this is pre-existing ejector moving some maximum velocity, say about uh, 0.8. And then at some point, at this radius, this uh, shock is breaking out from this shell. So because uh, after so gravitational wave is emitted, ends at t equals zero, and then goes this way, and at the same time this ejector head moving, following these gravitational waves, at, at this velocity. So the time delay. The GW GRB is roughly one minus beta. Something like this. And if you put this at point eight, you get the two second. This is a, what a, 
So before the breakout, the jet is jet spends its time inside the ejector. It takes before the breakout, until breakout, it takes uh, some time, like 10 seconds or 20 seconds, because just R divided by C. This is the time when the jet reached uh, the ejector. Right. In principle, uh, yes, this is a sort of motivated by simulation, and also, if you specify some emission model, you can get the, like this is the right value. But uh, zero point eight, zero point. Yeah, you can calculate the. Uh, of course, if you take this value very, very close to C, it's, this delay is very small. Yeah. I'm, I'm not saying this is a solution, but uh, this is one explanation. So, uh, yeah. Yes. So, is this the only. Um, Time difference between gravitational wave and GRB thing only via this mechanism, or uh, there are different mechanisms could be there which can cause this delay. Sorry, uh, can you say one again? delay between gravitational wave signal and GRB signal is due to this breakout. So, are there other mechanism via which this delay could be uh, could be caused, like uh, HNMS uh, going spin downing to a black hole formation that will take some time and all these things? Right. Uh, yes. Uh, the, so there should be some, okay, you're saying, for example, the merger occurs t equals zero, say t equals zero, and jet is formed after some time. So this time, until jet forms, this is the minimum delay time. So we can't see photons before jet produced. So this is the minimum delay time. And here, after that, the jet spent its time about 10 seconds inside the ejector, in the lab frame, and break out from the ejector. So my naive guess is uh, the time scale that the jet forms is less than this two seconds, let's say much less than one second maybe 10 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds, then this would be okay. If you see the jet uh, GRB just after merger, like a uh, delay with uh, one, 10 milliseconds, then probably this time scale is uh, not responsible for this ejector, but just jet uh, is produced after 10 milliseconds. If of axis, yeah, if of axis, yes, but now, I'm saying this is uh, on axis. Uh, now, something moving like this. Lorentz factor of gamma. And uh, I'm looking at this object. with some set of view. So first of, of all, you can calculate delta t. So this is, I would say, the lab frame, that's the frame of the explosion. And this is observer frame. So you can calculate. So this is gamma or beta. Uh, so assume this emit photons here, like this. 
And what is the observer time compared to the lab frame? So you can calculate, for example, 1 minus beta. Yes. If I'm, I'm, I'm on axis case, then just this goes like uh, this expression. But if I have uh, some off axis angle, I have extra cosine. Uh, T lab is not a co moving frame. If you are on the co moving frame, the co-moving frame T prime, you need another gamma. But now I'm saying this T lab is the rest frame of the merger, say merger. So yes, you are saying the times delta T on the co-moving frame, delta T observer is uh, gamma minus beta theta v, delta t, co-moving frame. So this is true. So because, uh, for example, if you want to calculate frequency, so frequency on the co-moving frame is new prime, and I observe frequency new, what is the relation? So new, new prime is uh, this factor. So if you go to on axis, the observer should be one over gamma square, and for the frequency is one over gamma. So now I have uh, how the photon frequency changes if you go to the alpha axis, so let's say peak energy should uh, transfer like this way. So peak energy, spectral energy, this is peak in the typical photon en energy. At theta view is uh, 1 minus beta. E peak in the co-moving frame. Now, let's. I want to compare this for the on-axis observer, which is uh, so the the ratio between the peak energy of the off-axis observer to the on-axis observer should be. say theta view equals zero. It's just this uh, ratio. What is this? This is uh, one minus beta. One minus beta sine v. So this is actually, if I take uh, Lorentz factor is large, then this factor is uh, something like this. Or, uh, And let's say if the theta is larger than one over gamma, so this ratio is 
it's just the sorry this is the one radian so this is a how much your peak energy suppressed by if you go to the off axis. This is gamma times viewing angle minus square. square. Now I want to also get the, this relation for the E ISO. So how much total energy I lose if I go to the off axis. So this is a, uh, I think in a tutorial, you can show Isotropic equivalent energy is uh, converted something like this. This is isotropic equivalent energy of the commoving frame. It's uh, gamma cube. So for the just energy, I have one Doppler factor. I call it Doppler factor. One Doppler factor for the energy. But this is uh, another Doppler factor squared for the, viewing, for the beaming effect. Because my solid angle goes like this. So this fact, in addition to the gamma one Doppler factor, I have additional two Doppler factor. So now I can do the same exercise. So I'm afraid that I'm going to confuse you. So this is a, I made some assumption. What was that? The assumption was uh, the jet is a very, very, very narrow. So I have a jet opening angle, say the jet. So in order to get this expression, essentially I assume the jet is uh, like a point particle, which means for the on-axis observer, the entire jet. So this is a one over gamma. So I assume in this derivation, I assume the, this Lorentz cone inclu include the total jet half opening angle. But in astrophysics, this is not really occurs. What usually occur is opposite case. So I have jet. And the Lorentz factor is so large, this own axis observer see just part of the jet. So this is one case. Let's say say the jet is much smaller than one over gamma. And in this case, I have a I, I need to correct some factor because this own axis observer doesn't see whole jet, just part of the jet. This is one over the cor correction factor should be something like this, because this guy see just one over gamma uh, solid angle, but jet actually emit. Total luminosity of the jet is from this uh, theta jet solid angle. So 
So in the end, this case, uh, say the jet, is uh, larger than one over gamma. And also delta theta is uh, larger than, sorry, And let me define the delta theta from here. In this case, it's a little bit, uh, you have to, from point, point particle approximation, you need to correct some uh, factor due, because this guy doesn't see whole entire jet. Sorry? Oh, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Now I'm thinking the jet has some size, so delta theta. And finally, if this olfaxis observer is very, very close to the jet, then what happens is uh, this guy, the emission is dominated by edge of the jet. Then you have additional correction when Delta theta is much smaller, smaller than uh, gamma, and uh, then this guy C is. I need some another correction, which is delta theta divided by theta jet square, because this guy the emission is dominated by the solid angle are about delta theta. So this case, E iso. So, yeah, it's a bit uh, complicated that uh, how e isotropic equivalent energy converted to the off-axis observers. But uh, first of all, the E peak is always converted by this factor, gamma delta theta minus squared. And the ISO depends on the, what situation are you thinking, you get this kind of... Uh, uh, relation. Then in, in tutorial you will see what is the requirement to get uh, this emission for the off axis observers. And I can show one example and then finish this uh, lecture. Actually, if you do this analysis and take, this is typical energy, and actually this time scale also converted to the off-axis observer, to on-axis observer. If, if I assume this is, this is very faint because we see this from off-axis, we see jet from off-axis. Let's, let's consider this situation. Then I, I need to convert all the time scale energy and the peak, peak energy to the on-axis observer and ask it makes sense or not. And if you do this calculation and then do the same exercise, <coughs> what Lorentz factor I need to the jet to be optically thin. So let's take a, 
EI. So for theta v is say typical short GRV. And uh, <coughs> actually, this case, the relevant case is actually this. You have to be very close to the off-axis. So let's take this uh, case. Because I saw this small amount of isotropic equivalent energy. Uh, delta theta, gamma, about 13. Then you get the... Uh, from this two of axis, you get a very small uh, EISO. And this Doppler, using this Doppler factor, you can get tau. What, when tau is, e you can ask when tau equal, is equal to unity. From here, I get the Lorentz factor of about 250. So because you have a huge amount of energy and the uh, time variability for the own axis observer is much shorter than this uh, 0.2 second. Your required Lorentz factor is quite high. Now from this and this, you can calculate what is delta theta. This is 0.05. This one? Yeah, this is a... I use this relation and uh, into the 51 erg and observe the GRB energy. So you need to be very close to the jet edge, like 0 0.05 radian, because the uh, required Lorentz factor that how of unity is very, very high, so you have to be very close to the axis. Then I have this and this, or this, this factor. What is E peak? E peak is uh, uh, on axis observer, is just this uh, gamma delta theta squared. This was uh, <coughs> 0 0.2 MeV. So from this, I can conclude that, that <coughs> E peak for, <coughs> excuse me, on axis observer is about 40 MeV. So this is uh, actually the main, I think, main difficulty of the off axis emission model because uh, if you want to do everything consistent, like EI, so it's typical short GRB, and this can emit photons, which, may, which means a tau of unity, then you get high Lorentz factor. And uh, also, and you have to be very close. So which means uh, you are in this regime. Now you can calculate what is expected the E peak for this such kind of burst. Then, what you conclude is about 40 MeV, which is far more above the typical E peak of the short GRBs. At this energy, this into the 51 erg, we don't see such kind of very high peak energy. Yes, it's a yes. It's a quite complicated. You you can try with this uh, with this uh, different assumption and uh, whether or not you can find uh, you can take typical short GRB's value for E i's on the E peak and convert to the off axis observer and try to get such low energy of the E i so and a relatively high energy of the E peak. So, yeah, I, to be honest, I haven't done all the possibilities. <laughs> so this is the one possibility. And then, yeah. Any more questions? <clears throat> 